Thank you, Dr. Wallace. And we're going to quickly transition into a panel discussion Q&A. We've got over 50 questions, I think, that came in on slido.com. So we're going to ask uh, the plenaries to come up. So Dr. Gentry, Dr. Dempster, uh, also Josh Vincent, uh, pastor of Trinity Bible Church and uh, head of the steering committee of the Gospel Coalition Arizona is also going to join us. So I, I, I introduced uh, Josh Vincent, newest to the, the team here now. I think Peter Gurry has, has been sufficiently introduced in the three plenaries also. Like I said, I'm looking at the, the same thing that you are, 57 questions uh, you all have asked uh, over the course of last night and this morning. The top rated question is going to go to Dr. Wallace because just, cause I'm last. Just, because, <laughs> just because it says, so do we have a first century Mark fragment or not? I'm sorry, what was this? So do we have a first century Mark fragment or not? That is the highest rated question on our slido.com. <laughs> this thing will dog me till I die. I Can you is hear it, me on this? Are the mics on? The mic's on? No, good. That's I can answer, and then we'll be done. How do we turn this on? Hello, are we on? There we go. It's on now. Okay, good. All right. So it's gonna dog you till what? <laughs> I'm gonna keep this brief because there's a lot of more important questions. I announced this in 2012 in my third debate with Bart Ehrman at his school, based on very good authority that we do have a first-century fragment of Mark's gospel. That was published in May of tw or April 2018, and it turned out to be a late second or early third century fragment of Mark's gospel. And I was duped, and consequently I've got an egg on my face. I've made an apology to Bart both privately and publicly. But the interesting thing is this is still the earliest fragment of Mark's gospel in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elijah Hickson, one of, one of uh, Peter's good buddies who co-edited uh, Myths and Mistakes is the one who really just unveil this whole thing. So, no, we don't have a first century fragment of Mark yet. I rather doubt that we're going to have a first century fragment of any portion of the New Testament. But we still have really early manuscripts. That's right. Uh, I want to ask a question. Um, maybe the, this, as I was scanning through these, uh, there are questions that I could describe as, as getting down into details, which are obviously very good. And there are some that are kind of bigger bigger type questions. And so I want to ask uh, a question that Sean Wagner uh, gave us. And, it's, and uh, Sean is wondering, should we or should we not say that the Bible is infallible in its original manuscript since we don't have the original manuscript? I, I think we could even substitute the word inerrancy there as well. Um, so I, if I'm understanding the question, is uh, do, does inerrancy matter? That is, the, the Bible's overall trustworthiness and reliability, does that doctrine matter since we don't have the autographs or the original manuscripts? So I'm just gonna kind of throw that one down the line um, and, uh, and anyone who wants to pick that up can, can do so. It wasn't addressed to anyone specifically. Well, I think the... Uh I think the canon was put together by Ezra and Nehemiah in the fourth century, and uh, we're very, uh, we're, that's a, that's a, we can, uh, with, the, with the evidence that we have at this moment, I think we can get back that far. So uh, with the principles of textual criticism, with the science of textual criticism, studying the, the manuscripts that have been preserved by God, we can, get back to that text. Can I take this from a different angle? Sure. Sure. Let's assume that we cannot get back to the original wording, or at least we're not, we're not sure. We don't have the original manuscripts, but the original wording is an entirely different matter. I'll just address the New Testament side. There are three or four different schools of textual criticism for the New Testament. And in each one of these schools where they have some differences as to what they think is the original wording. We have evangelicals with a high view of Scripture, which means that what they believe is the original text does not have errors in it. And so regardless of whether the original text is text A, text B, text C, or text C, evangelicals do not have errors in what they've seen. 
I think that's very significant. In fact, I would go so far as to say that uh, textual criticism doesn't even rise to reaching the radar of uh, non-evangelical scholars in terms of, well, these are um, things that are problems for inerrancy. There are plenty of passages that we have a lot of difficulty with, frankly, but the textual variants are not among them. That's not where you're going to get these problems. So I think whatever we regard as the original, I think we can make that claim. I, I wrote an article in some book, I forgot, but uh, on, on this about the illogic of assuming that uh, the original is not uh, inerrant. So yeah, good. If you can look that up, you can tell them what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, anything to add? Yeah, I, um, I think it goes back, let's say I'm going back to, let's say, a prophet. A prophet is inspired. Um, the prophet gets the communication. Uh, the prophet faithfully um, presents it, um, and then, then that's written down. I think that's very, very important. Um, we may not have, it's sort of like I remember um, a theologian once saying, um, it's like this when we look at these manuscripts, etc. It's like, uh, um, let's say there's a flood sort of going over a bridge. You can still walk over the bridge even though there's a, a, a foot of water on it. I mean, it still does the job, and I think uh, I think that's what I, I think that it's 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 really it's right there, um, uh, and I think it's really really important. Um, just the same. Thank you, Josh. Do you have anything to add? As a yeah, I mean, I think pastorally, question comes up. Yeah. yeah, we we talk about inerrancy a lot. Um, we put it in our statement of faith. We teach it in our internship, and uh, usually people are surprised when they actually read the Chicago Statement on Inerrancy what it actually says. So everything that we've said here today would fit right in line with uh, what inerrancy would be defined as. It's really more of a theological word than it is an actual, I think, accurate word. It's kind of unfortunate because you know infallibility is stronger in the way that you look at the Bible. But I do think it. I have seen it be important. Maybe you can come up with a better word, and I'm fine with that. But it's become kind of a, a plumb line for churches and denominations to say, do we really trust that, that God has spoken and that the God who is absolutely incomprehensible has chosen to make himself known to finite creatures? And when you begin to look at it that way, it's, it's a major divide line between people who say, we're going to use the word of God in the way that we want for the purposes that we desire. And those who say, we are going to humbly submit ourselves to the word of God and we're going to study. We believe it's a spiritual thing to study hard and that teachers are a spiritual gift to the church so that we really can't understand what the text originally said. So reading the Bible isn't easy. Um, and that's why I'm grateful for guys like you and happy to, you know, celebrate being the ordinary man on the pa panel. So, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Can I, if I was just add one thing to that, I think I could speak for the other folks on the panel, that one of the reasons why they do what they do is because they believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Um, so Dan showed you multiple, multiple ways to say, was it Jesus loves Mary? Mm -hmm. John loves Mary, sorry. Sorry, John. I failed. I've already graduated. I've already graduated. Um, I'm just a teacher. Um, I think all of us would say the meaning is the same, but be precisely because we treasure the words of God, we do want to know the precise form to the degree that we can with the evidence that we have, right? So we continue to do our work. I know that's why Dan travels around the world to photograph manuscripts is because he does care. So... Okay, very good. I'm going to try to hit some more of these, and we'll answer them rapid fire. What are some of the textual variants in the Old Testament tradition that fall into the third category or serious differences, and how serious are these differences? So someone wants to know, and we'll direct this one to, yeah, to you, Peter. Yeah. Does, uh, <clears throat> is um, Anthony Ferguson still here? Uh, he is, I think. He's over here. Well, uh, <laughs> as far as I, uh, An Anthony Ferguson is the first person to do uh, an exhaustive and exhausting and still further exhausting analysis of these kinds of variants. Uh, yeah, so there's a variant. You can see my dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you can see my dissertation. The full PDF is available on ProQuest. And I have a long, long table in the back that's, I think, maybe 10 pages where I give all of these statistics. So you can look there. 
Uh, but some of these, but the category three variants are, are variants that cannot be attributed to common scribal practices. So what do scribes do? What do they typically do? What are common scribal reasons that give rise to these variants? Some of these reasons I talked about last night about our uh, poor copying, uh, the desire to interpret the word of God, which I think actually indicates that inerrancy is an ancient concept because you have scribes who want to make it very clear that there is no contradiction in scripture, so they harmonize. And these are found in second century BC documents. So inerrancy in the second century BC. And um, uh, so you have uh, poor copying, harmonization, interpretation. So if, if there's a difference that can't be reasonably attributed to that, I classified those as category three. One of those would be, uh, there's a few of those in a Lamentations text. There is one in uh, 1Q Isaiah A. And perhaps there's a Joshua text that reworks, um, reworks uh, the crossing of the Jordan. And that could be attributed to uh, a category three variant as well. So reworking the text and then just differences where it de the difference doesn't seem to harmonize the text or interpret the text, and there doesn't seem to be any reason why there'd be a scribal error, there's a, at least one of those in the Lamentations text. But <laughs> see the dissertation. So. But, uh, but they, we could say the same thing for the Old Testament that we're saying for the New. Mm -hmm. These are not going to change mm -hmm. uh, our beliefs. Mm -hmm. uh, I did my dissertation on the book of Job. Before I did my dissertation, everyone, hunt, everyone in the previous hundred years believed this, this, the, the Greek translation of Job is one-sixth shorter than the Hebrew text. And all scholars believed that this was because it was based on a, a, a different Hebrew text that was probably better. And I showed, after 10 years, <laughs> I showed that he abbreviated these long, windy speeches for his Greek audience because they were too boring. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Let me let me let me kick. <laughs> let me let, let me yeah. kick kick it to us another another direction. Thank you, uh, Anthony, for coming in there, pinch hitting. It was good. Um, can you explain if we should consider the longer ending of Mark canon, and how was it added in some manuscripts? And I want to add also for our our preacher on on panel here uh, whether we would preach from the longer ending of Mark or not. Um, but I, I assume that question is for Dr. Wallace, and then we'll, then we'll go to Josh. There is a variety of opinions on this issue among evangelicals, even those who believe that the long ending is not part of the original text of Mark. In my view, I would say I would not preach it. I would uh, mention that uh, most manuscripts, the great majority of manuscripts we have today, actually do have those 12 verses. The two oldest manuscripts we have, as well as the oldest representatives of the three major versions, and church fathers through the fourth century say uh, they, they either don't have it, or the church fathers like uh, Eusebius, who was commissioned by Emperor Constantine to create 50 Bibles for the capital city. He wrote that, uh, as far as he could tell, he's found almost no manuscripts that had anything after verse 8. This is in the fourth century. Now, later on, uh, that became the majority, but what was the majority in the fourth century was obviously quite different from what is in the majority today. The issues that uh, scholars face and preachers face is this. If, uh, first of all, was the real ending lost? If the real ending is lost, then surely something like this, although not this ending, would have been original. And so many people say, let's go ahead and preach it. Uh, others would say, no, I think Mark intended to end his gospel at verse 8. And that's the view that I take. It's not something that I'll die on a hill for. You can't even cut off a fingernail for it. But it's something that uh, uh, I, I have done a, a lot of research on this over the years. It's interesting. Mark starts his gospel with the title of the book, The Beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's giving us a clue. He's not going to come to the end. Um, so there's, there's a lot of other evidence that suggests that. But if I, I want to respect the human author who is every bit as much author as the divine author is. 
And if Mark intended to end his gospel at verse 8, what he is doing is an ancient rhetorical device, very similar to what we see in the book of Jonah, where it's, mm. it, it's a conclusion that doesn't conclude, and it draws the readers right into the story. What are you going to do about Jesus? The way Mark 16, 8 ends is the women were told by the angel to go and meet the disciples in Galilee and tell them that Jesus uh, will meet them there. And they did nothing, for they were afraid. Period. End of story. What a downer. But if you've got persecution raging at that time, you have to own your faith. And to own your faith, you have to wrestle through these convictions just like Jesus told his disciples after he revealed that the Messiah would have to die. He said, take up your cross and follow me. So it's far more, and this answers a, a later question I saw, dealing with these texts hits our lives hard because that kind of an issue means that how we wrestle with the Gospel of Mark also tells us how committed we are to Jesus Christ. I'm not saying the view you take of which ending is right, but I'm saying if you really truly believe that when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me, he meant it. That should affect our lives. <laughs> and the way I read Mark's Gospel is he ends his Gospel at 16.8 on purpose so that readers will take up their cross and follow Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Good. Josh, anything to add to that? Yeah, we only read it whenever we're handling snakes in service. So right, right, exactly. Too yes, um, exactly. But uh, yeah. no, we, we... Just so we're clear, we don't do that at Trinity Bible Church. <laughs> Just so we're clear. I kind of okay. wanted to let that dangle, but that's fine. Um, no, we, at our church, we typically preach expositionally, and I've been trained under men who um, have preached the, the longer ending of, of Mark, um, have a lot of respect for them. Um, it, it doesn't seem, you know, obviously like it's in the original text, and so we, we don't preach it. When we got to that ending in Mark in our service, um, I did the brave thing as a pastor and had one of our Greek scholars preach that for me, uh, <laughs> which was great. Um, but he did what we would do, which is we would preach the whole chapter and we would spend the first few moments explaining why we're not preaching the whole thing, um, just as a teaching moment, explaining it to them, and then end with actually preaching the Word of God. Um, but I think it's also just important in the local church context that you are having these kinds of conversations with your people so that they're not shocked when they're listening to NPR and they hear Bert Ehrman or whenever you say we're not going to preach this because it's not in the Bible, but it's in their Bible. We just don't want them confused and shocked in that moment. Yeah. Good. I'm going I'm to buy a few more minutes here, just because there were so many good questions. Um, one, one issue that didn't come up, I'm going to direct this one to Dr. Dempster. How does the Apocrypha fit into the discussion of canonical writings? Yes, um, um, that's, that's a great question. Um, um, when you look at uh, some of the early, li well, first of all, the, uh, it, you're, it's obvious that there is in that fourth Ezra other books that are being written and that are comp competing with this. And when you see uh, early lists, um, um, early Christian lists, you find um, books that ha are added to the end. For example, Origen has a list of the 22 books, and then he puts in first and second Maccabees at the end. But it's clearly there's a dividing line. Um, and these books obviously were uh, used in Judaism. They were uh, used for edification in the church. Uh, more of them uh, seem to uh, um, get added to these lists. And then, of course, you have the problem uh, that you saw in the quote from Athanasius where they're getting interspersed. And so I think really what happens as you move further and further away from the east, which is Jerusalem, um, you're getting these books that are used in the church and that are helpful, um, but, uh, but there's some confusion as to whether they have canonical authority or not. And so he, he is trying to address that, I think, in 367. So uh, there's no question you have these, some of these books. Uh, and, um, you know, um, uh, Jerome has to deal with it in, in translating it, translating these books from the Hebrew. And he call, talks about the Hebrew truth. There is, there is this, um, this dividing line. He says that there's a tradition of reading some of these books uh, in the church, um, but he wants to make a, a, a distinction. These are not canonical books. And I really think that... Uh, the church has this awareness of these books that um, 
as it's grown um, that are for edification, and they're a certain number, uh, and then it has another group which we just won't read at all. Uh, and, they're, uh, and there's kind of a, I don't know, some ambiguity there in terms of the, 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 um, the language. Um, but I actually think you, with your canonical lists uh, and your work, could answer the question better than I. <laughs> no, I, well, yeah. <laughs> Did you just kick yeah, that yeah, over yeah, to yeah, me? Yeah, that's right. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is it bad if I'm the one that asked that question? No, no I'm no, just no, kidding. No, no. I didn't. Was that your question? Let's no, have that. Yeah. No, no. No. How many times did you vote for it? That's right. I think I can only vote once. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I don't have much to add, actually. I think that was, that was very good. The apocryphal books clearly were important books uh, to, to, to Jews and to early Christians, but I don't think they would have put them on the same level mm -hmm as the canonical books, okay? So uh, we, we learn much later that uh, uh, Christians and Jews seem to have books of primary authority, mm -hmm. primary importance, but they had books that they, they didn't relegate to dangerous right mm -hmm. away. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas, for example, would have been a dangerous book, okay? Uh, the book of Enoch would have kind of gone down into that category as well, if you're talking to someone like, uh, Athanasius or someone like that. Um, but books like Judith, Tobit, uh, The Shepherd of Hermas even, uh, the, these books would have been found uh, to be useful uh, and orthodox, but they would, the earliest Christians would not have put, based a point of doctrine mm. upon them. They would have helped illustrate mm. what true religion uh, was. Like Grudem's systematic theology. Oh, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I do think the best example for our day, though, is something like Pilgrim's Progress. Mm. Because mm. It, it, it's not like a brand new book that just entered into that intermediate category. Uh, you have to think through books that were around for a few centuries that still were not canonical, mm. you see, but were still found to be helpful and useful. So that, so what Pilgrim's Progress is that for us, I would say. It's, it's been around for centuries, and we still, we look to it not as the Bible, mm. but we do look to it as illustrating much biblical truth, right? I think, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. in terms of the English Bible, I mean, uh, um, it's only been relatively recently that we haven't had the Apocrypha in our Bible. Right, no, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's yeah. true. I have one last question, and the reason I'm going to ask it is because it was a theme that ran through a bunch of them. We'll end with this, um, and, and that is, how does the accuracy of the Bible compare to the accuracy of other ancient religious texts, such as the Quran or the Vedas, uh, and how do we know? Um, I only bring it up because it, it surfaced a lot, which shows some interest there. Does anyone have any comment on that? I, I can do a, a little bit on this. There have been, in recent years, some decent text-critical studies on the Quran. Uh, Keith Small did his doctoral dissertation on this at London School of Theology. He had to do it under a pseudonym because uh, he, he feared for his life. Uh, he died of leukemia just a year ago, but uh, he wrote on a comparison of the Quran and the New Testament in terms of the, the textual criticism. Uh, there's more work being done on that now. Dan Brubaker got a book published just a few months ago on 20 corrections in early Quran manuscripts. He did his dissertation where he found thousands of corrections in the Quran. And one of the things that Keith Small argued in, in his work is that uh, both texts are pretty darn reliable. Uh, the, the thing we need to keep in mind is that our goal is not to say the Bible is the most faithfully copied book in ancient history. Our goal is to say, is it, is it reliable? Is it something that points us to God and does so we can have a, a, an assurance that this really is the God who speaks? So we don't want to uh, play king of the hill with this kind of stuff. At the same time, when the Quran started to get copied, it was after some of these Christian manuscripts were out. And I think their goal was to be apologetic. That is, they wanted to show ours is the word of God because of the careful copying. And there were scribes who would get severely penalized when they made mistakes, although we see them in Quran manuscripts now. 
uh, that have been hidden over the centuries. What's interesting is for the New Testament, and I think this is a huge difference between our two holy books, uh, the New Testament was copied and called Scripture, no matter what translation it was in. Same with the Old Testament. With the Quran, the only true Quran is the one in Arabic. Everything else is called interpretation. Well, why is that? Because they are more concerned to have an apologetic value to it than they are about the truth of what they're claiming. Mm -hmm. The New Testament points to something far greater than itself, which is Jesus Christ. And I think if we get lost in the shuffle and say, well, our, we, we have a lot more errors in our copies than Quran manuscripts, which is certainly true, then we're missing the whole point. They translated this into various languages, called it scripture, because they were far more concerned about spreading the gospel than they were about making every jot and tittle exactly right. And still, they didn't miss the, the, uh, the veritable word of God. They got it. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. This was a, a helpful panel, and, a, and just a, a, the conference exceeded my expectations, and uh, I hope you all were edified and uh, well, felt well instructed uh, also. So would you just give, me, give these guys a hand, please, for... Uh...